Hello everyone. Welcome to Net Diligence Virtual Cyber Risk Summit. My name is Heather Osborne and I'm the Director of Global Events and Programming at Net Diligence, a cyber risk assessment and data breach services company. Net Diligence is pleased to bring our thought leading content to the virtual space with this new webinar series. Visit our website at www.netdiligence.com to get more information about our upcoming webinars and in-person events. Before we begin, I'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our Virtual Cyber Risk Summit sponsors, particularly Aspen Insurance, our diamond sponsor. I'd also like to thank our 100 plus speakers for bringing their thought leadership to our program. For today's webinar, we will be using the ON24 platform. Right now, you should be viewing the ON24 dashboard, which shows the live viewing screen. During the webcast, all participants will be in listen-only mode. Today's presentation is slated for approximately 45 minutes, with 15 minutes at the end for questions. Our panel of speakers will be taking questions throughout the session via the questions widget. Please type in questions during the presentation and click submit. If your question is of immediate import or concerns technical problems, you will receive an immediate answer by text. You can also find a widget entitled Resources, where you can download assets provided by the speakers and sponsors for each webinar. Just click the resource in the box and it will be automatically downloaded. If you are interested in receiving CLE or CE accreditation for this program, you must stay on for the full duration of the webinar and answer three polling questions that will appear during the course of the program. Additionally, please fill out the participant information questions. This will ensure that you are correctly matched to the state and professional organization. As a reminder, this webcast is being recorded. After the presentation, you will receive an archive link for further review or for sharing. The webinar will also be available for future viewing on our website. Again, thank you for joining the Net Diligence Virtual Cyber Risk Summit. We hope you enjoy the program. Hi, everybody. Come on in. You're in the right place. We're here today to talk about an exciting topic. We're here to talk about tricky data breaches, data breaches that impact managed IT service providers or managed security service providers. And this is an awesome topic, and I'm excited to be able to moderate it for you. My name's Stu Panansky. I am a partner at the Fisher Broyles Law Firm, and I appreciate that diligence giving me the opportunity to moderate today's panel. And with me today to talk about this exciting subject is my awesome panel of speakers who I'm going to introduce right now, beginning with the Vice President and Cyber Product Head of Hiscox, Megan Hannes. Welcome, Megan. Next up, we have the Vice President of Incident Response for Tetra Defense, Nathan Little. Thank you, Nathan. Next, we have the Claim Technical Officer and Assistant Vice President of CNA's Cyber Technology Fidelity Media Life Agent Broker Dealer and Professional Liability Claims. It's Brendan Kelly. Thank you, Brendan. And finally, partner from the Cozen O'Connor Law Firm, David Walton. Thank you, David. And thank you all for joining me today. So some of you might know that we've been to some of the other Net Diligence virtual panels that we have to do these poll questions during the presentation. So the first one today, is, first poll question is, what does MSP stand for? Does it stand for Model Standards Policy, Managed Service Provider, the Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport, or a magnificent shiny platypus? Bonus points to anyone who can illustrate for me a magnificent shiny platypus and email me a copy of their illustration. Let's move on to the agenda. We are going to talk about the roles that MSPs and MSSPs play in the world, in the business world today. We're going to talk about different theories of liability against MSPs and MSSPs. We're going to talk about standards of care. We're going to talk about defenses, damages issues, coverage issues, breach issues all kinds of stuff. It's going to be an absolutely exciting time. And let's get started. So Nathan, let's start with you. Let's just start with the very foundation. What is an MSP and what's the difference between an MSP and an MSSP? Yeah, thanks, Stu. 
So it, in the simplest form, an, an MSP is really just an outsourced IT department for an organization. It's extremely common these days. Almost every organization has at least entirely outsourced their IT or has some sort of piece of it that's provided by an outsourced company, which could be an MSP. So MSPs are managing servers, managing workstations for an organization, um, everything from every day-to-day -day IT tasks to just certain pieces of it. But they have access to every single one of their clients, full access to their environment so that they can manage it. Um, the difference between an MSP and an MSSP, managed security service provider, is typically a managed security service provider is only focused on the security and protecting of the network, where an MSP sometimes provides security services as well, but is more focused on day-to-day -day IT operation. Both of them are big risks because typically if both are providing a good service, they have tools that allow remote access to, into the environment. They have full control over every aspect of the IT organ piece of the organization, which is where cyber incidents like ransomware data breaches occur. Um, so that's just what they are. Pretty much an IT provider, the difference is they provide, rather than just internal IT, they provide IT to hundreds or thousands of clients simultaneously. Okay. Uh, Brendan Kelly, CNA, tell me, why is this such a hot topic in 2020? We go through a lot of uh, there's always a hot topic or, or another uh, every year. Why is this the the hot topic this year? I, you know, it, it it's uh, well. First of all, it's great to be part of this panel, Stu, and and thanks for having me on the panel. It's always good to be part of something that that diligence does. Um, why is this hot in 2020? You know, cyber has always been and continues to be. What can threat actors, what can the bad actors translate, convert their actions to in terms of dollars? So if we go back in time and we look at the big ones, right, if we look at a target, um, if, if we look at any of the hotel breaches, right, it's all about collecting customer information and what that might be work, worth on the dark web. That sort of PII information, the credit card information. Today, the value, right, and how these threat actors can translate their actions into big dollars is through going after MSPs. And why? Because of the wealth of information that's there. And so that's why it's a hot topic in 2020, and in fact, you know, bled into the later part of 2019, that it's one stop shopping for them in a very big way. David, stay on that point for a second. Stay on Brendan's point about the kinds of data that MSPs traffic in. Do you want to address that? Because, you know, it, they're not like banks and they're not like hospitals. No, they're like uh, 15 banks or maybe 150 banks, 150 hospitals, 150 law firms, 150 types of all types of businesses, all combined at the same watering hole. So just uh, pivoting off of what uh, Brendan was saying, I mean, they traffic in all types of data. There is every, every specific type of data that you can think about, be it structured or unstructured data. Uh, and the types of data that they are storing and working with is growing every day. And just like uh, Nate was saying at the beginning, uh, especially in MSP is like an outsourced IT department. And we all know that they're going to keep growing. And so in terms of the traffic, in terms of the data that uh, MSPs traffic in, it's every type of data that you can think of. You know, starting at, you know, PHI, PII, you know, everything else on down the line. They uh, uh, have it. And just like uh, Brandon was saying, they, that's why they're such a big target, because they're the, the pure a watering hole for data. And, and I think so that's that sounds a, like an awful. Sorry, Stu. I just had a, a quick thought because you, you, you mentioned the growth of, of MSPs, and I think that's a really interesting point because there's not that many other organizations that you could ensure 
And when you write the policy, they have no access to protected health information, none at all. And three months later, all of a sudden they land a hospital as a client, and now they have 180,000 PHI records or a million. There's not that many other organizations that data could grow that exponentially and different into different organizations and types of data like that. Wow, uh, Megan, that sounds like a ton of risk. Uh, is Hiscox insuring these MSPs? And if so, what are some of the underwriting considerations or issues that are encountered when you receive an application from one of these types of policyholders? Sure. So MSPs have historically been in the tech and cyber insurance portfolio, and certainly not just at Hiscox, but across, across the market. I think what you're seeing is, is twofold, is certainly an awareness and then increased tools and, ag and really an aggravated approach against MSPs. You know, Nathan brought up a really good point in that you can have an MSP in a certain industry servicing certain customers, and then all of a sudden they, they may go out and secure a hospital, um, for example. And that would not be in the application in terms of what industries your clients typically operate in. Um, that's one example of how dynamic this market is. Um, but another example is contracts. So historically, you know, for me, I think MSPs have been well within appetite because contracts in the event of data breach or third-party legal liability have been, have been largely stonewalled against clients. And that, that landscape has certainly evolved over the past uh, few years as the liability awareness has increased on behalf of the customers. Uh, another dynamic evolving is awareness around extortionists of just how deep and wide this well is in terms of potential financial gain, and that's twofold. That could be data exfiltration just by virtue of the, the, the value of the data held, but also in an aggravated approach we've seen recently in terms of getting these organizations to pay ransoms even when there's resiliency measures in place for not only the MSP if they're attacked or their customers in terms of, in terms of keeping them up and running. And that, and that dynamic has been extortionists actually videotaping the insides of environments and using that footage as additional leverage to get the extortionists um, the money that they're demanding. So uh, extortion demands have gotten catastrophically larger over the past several months and years. Um, but specifically, you know, we're talking 10, 20-fold increases over the last several months in terms of these extortion demands. And extortionists are getting wiser and wiser into getting companies to pay that and MSPs, for me, are just, they're right, and they're right in there because they're in the business of security, right? They, um, and obviously there's many variants out there, whether it's MSP or MSSP, but they're in the business of securing infrastructure. So for them to have a breach, you know, that's a reputational event for me beyond a normal benchmark what you'd consider a reputational event for other organizations. And so it goes back to the age old, you know, no one's baby is ugly, meaning you go into an MSP, you go to the IT department, and they say, well, we're fine, we're fine. And so you, you may get a dynamic that is a bit, uh, a bit defensive because they're supposed to be in the business of security, and yet they have a breach, and the extortionists know that. So they, they actually videotape the environments to prove, hey, we got in, We'll publish this video if you don't pay the extortion demand we want. So, you know, MSPs, they have um, certainly evolved over time in terms of awareness. They themselves haven't changed, but for, I think, the contract provisions, awareness, um, and extortionists obviously getting far more clever and sophisticated. Uh, thank you for that response. You, know, you were saying about how uh, there's, you said, MSPs were always part of an insurance company's portfolio, and now it's something that insurance companies are focusing much more uh, specifically on. And Nathan mentioned also, and, and David, a growth in the MSP space, and that is certainly consistent with 
our experience from the breach council perspective because when we first three years ago a lot of times we were hand, working with in-house IT where everything was done internally with the in-house IT department and now it's I feel it's certainly more times than not if almost exclusively you're handle, working with an MSP during the incident response process coordinating with IT forensics and e-discovery etc. I wanted to move on to the next slide. I want to move on to the next slide and talk about what happens when the MSP or the MSSP is the subject of a security or privacy incident. And one of the issues that we've been flirting with d during the last uh, subject was about how the MSP touches multiple of its own clients. And so there's like this link, is like a funnel through the MSP onto a, a numerosity of other entities. Nathan, let's go back to you here. So what happens when the MSP uh, is, is the subject of a compromise? Why is there this, from a technical perspective, why is there this risk? Yeah, thanks, Stu. I, I think it helps to dive a little bit deeper into the, the tools that MSPs use and then the techniques that the attackers use. So most MSPs will have some sort of remote management tool into their clients' networks so that if I am managed by an IT provider and I'm working from London or wherever it may be, no matter where I am in the world, they can manage my computer and help me with my issues. And that extends to every single server that a company has, where their backups are stored, everything, because it allows them to provide a better service and a lot of these remote management tools are their third-party products, a third party to the MSP and to the MSP's clients. Like you know, Screen Connect is one, one of the major remote management tools. So what can sometimes happen is not only are the MSPs a, a huge risk, if they all use the same remote management tool, 100 different MSPs with tens of thousands of different clients combined if they use the same remote management tools and that tool has a vulnerability that attackers can find in the wild and exploit all of them simultaneously, that can cause multiple MSPs to be compromised by the same type of attack. Uh, it's one playbook. Uh, it's interesting that the cybercrime world always mirrors the business world or maybe the business world mirrors the cybercrime world where these cyber criminals, they try to find channels to deploy their attacks. So they want to compromise MSPs because then that's a channel for their attack to compromise a ton more victims. But then they also want to compromise as many MSPs simultaneously. So they look for similarities, similar attack vectors that they can use in these MSPs to compromise MSPs specifically. And we see that all the time. Um, when an MSP is compromised, what happens is whether they were targeted specifically or an attacker just realizes they've hit an MSP with a successful infiltration to their network, they'll, they'll pause, they'll slow down, they'll think, okay, rather than just infecting this MSP, what's the fastest way I can infect all of their clients, steal data from all of their clients, encrypt all of the client's data, whatever attack or combination of attacks like Megan mentioned, they decide to do. And then they use the attackers or they use the IT, the MSPs, existing tools as the attack tools, and they actually simultaneously use all of those remote management tools that the IT provider, the MSP, would typically use to deploy Microsoft Office updates or any updates to deploy specific attacks like ransomware and can simultaneously just launch all of the malicious acts. Um, and typically they're doing it in ways that aren't monitored by endpoint protection or antivirus. Um, so the attackers will just work off their existing tools to compromise the victims. Okay, so um, really what we're talking about is when there's an MSP security incident, one that hits, as, as Nathan suggested, these remote management tools and other links between the service provider and the client, you're really automatically increasing the numerosity of claimants because there's suddenly a number of impacted entities all at the same time. Megan, let me go back to you. Uh, can you talk about that? Can you talk about that risk exposure, um, that dynamic there, wh wh whereas it might 
contrast from other kinds of policyholders. Right. What makes MSP claims uh, so so tricky is that it ticks every single box. In some boxes, you may not even know you have. Um, with the MSP themselves, it's going to be largely first party. So data breach, if there's an exfiltration component, uh, certainly BI if it's a ransomware event. You've got investigation, repair, potentially notification, reputational harm. But what makes this incredibly interesting is the 500,000, 2,000, whatever that client base looks like, dependent upon who's impacted, how widespread the attack is, uh, the, either data and or a resultant BI event for the clients. And so that gets incredibly tricky very quickly in terms of the third party legal liability claims that may come in. Um, you have resultant damages like unintentional breach of contract, unintentional breach of privacy policy. You can have you know, damages that purport the client's customer's notification costs or the customer's client's notification costs. So it, 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 there are many downstream effects. And again, two things have changed over the course of the last year, maybe two years at best, in terms of the dynamic. So one, contracts are changing, uh, where they have typically been on a very broad basis, quite ironclad. Uh, we're seeing perhaps a bit more ambiguity. There's a lot more competition in the space, um, downright to affirmative calls for um, indemnity agreements in the event that the MSP themselves are attacked or go down. So it gets to be a hornet's nest uh, for uh, folks in our claims department uh, very, very tricky. And then you also have the added complexity of the further downstream event of any potential subrogation that may arise from one carrier's policy to the other carrier's policy because ca carrier A most likely is going to insure the MSP. Carrier B, C, D, E, and F are going to insure that, that DBI, uh, that customer of the MSP and then file back and filtrate back any sort of potential damages uh, that stem from that original either exfiltration and or extortion event. So Brendan Kelly, you uh, help manage a cyber claims team. Can you stay with some of the themes that Megan just went through, some of the difference between how, I guess, internally your team handles uh, figuring out the first party exposure, the third party exposure, some of the, the claim handling? techniques there? there? I mean, look, I think Megan nailed it, right? It's to, to go away with the visual that, you know, when this hits, um, it is a hornet's nest, right? That's, that's really the way this plays out. And she, she, you know, Megan did a great job of also identifying, right, that we, it's still the traditional first party exposures that we see with any uh, type of incident like this. It just happens that it converts into this hornet's nest, as Megan says, because it checks every box. And because of all the adjectives that each one of us has been throwing around, right? Aggregation, numerosity, multiplicity. And, and, and here's the thing that we have to remember. When everyone was talking earlier about you know, that how deep and wide is this well, right? So when we're talking about MSPs, what's different in terms of first-party exposure, in terms of third-party exposure? They have essentially the keys to the kingdom, right? That's, that's the thing. They, because of the remote management ability, right, their reach is far greater typically than anything that we've seen. So the, the effect of an immediate complexity that's attached, whether we're talking about, as Megan was referencing, historically what the contracts look like, and what they're looking like today, how they're getting tighter, who owns what? What are the indemnification provisions? And then also, right, as Megan points out, 
it's not just the MSP's policy that's going to be in play, but if we're talking about that they have 100 clients, 1,000 clients, do each one of them have a policy? Is that in play? How do they interwork? So it is sort of act one of multiple acts, as we said at the get-go of this presentation, right? What's happening in 2020? This is unfolding in 2020. So when you ask what's it look like when it, it comes internally, it's we're, we're at, each one of these almost is a new breed unto itself because the complexity, the type of MSP, the type of information, is it financial, is it health care, what's their customer base look like, what do the contracts look like. Each one almost stands alone and speaks for itself. I appreciate that, Brendan. I'd like to continue on this uh, subject about the security incident response, the, the, the so the real-world incident response when an MSP is the subject of, a, of an occurrence, and just talk about something very practical. <clears throat> My experience when we have these assignments, the MSP, they are IT professionals themselves. They are, they've been to school, they have degrees, they're engineers, uh, some of them are very accomplished, and there's a, just a human ego personality sensitivity that has to be accounted for when you handle these matters. And when you bring on the carrier panel IT forensics firm to uh, introduce them into the incident response, the, there is this human tension, I think, that develops that you have to, as counsel, be very cognizant of and, and try to diffuse. And I, I see that a lot. And then the IT forensics itself is often complicated due to the technology. Um, and then, of course, there's the notification issues, which is really the, the I mean, that's why we're all here, right? So, uh, David, why don't we go back to you and talk about that? Because a lot of the times, it's not like HIPAA. There's no, there's no HIPAA statute that's governing MSPs. There's no overarching statutory regime there. But what they do, do, ha what they do have a lot of, the MSPs, are, are service contracts with their clients as well as state data breach statutes, and as well as industry standards. So can you talk about the obligation to notify as it pertains to the MSP space and privacy occurrences? Sure. I think the, MS, I think the uh, notification obligation in the MSP space has got to be one of the most difficult and complex out there, just to pivot on what uh, Brendan was saying, you know, with Megan's, uh, other than the analogy or metaphor of the, of the hornet's nest, it's a perfect one, especially when it comes to uh, notification obligations. And you know, and I think Nate said this earlier too that you, know, you might be an MSP, you might be starting off, and you, your first 50 clients might not be of healthcare pro providers. Maybe it's banks, maybe it's other non-health companies, and then suddenly you, you start getting of uh, hospitals and of uh, healthcare data. So when you're dealing with uh, notice issues on, you know, when, when they're dealing with an MSP, it's the sheer volume of the types of data and the types and the number of different clients which may be breached, which is going to exponentially uh, make your notice obligations more complex. You do have issues, uh, HIPAA issues that you've got to worry about. Most MSPs, if they have HIPAA data, are going to be business associates, and they have business associates agreements, and they have the uh, HIPAA regulatory of regime that they have to come and comply with. Everybody on this call knows about the GDPR, what happens if you have data in there that's covered by the GDPR, that's uh, international based, based in Europe, and you, and you may have to comply with that. All 50 states now have data breach laws. You, sure, you certainly have to comply with that. Um, in terms of more practical um, tips or more practical considerations is, you know, when you have a notice, it's, um, when you have a breach, you, you have all the general notice issues that you have to comply with and consider, like uh, do you report to law enforcement? Uh, is this going to cause, as, as Megan was saying earlier, reputational damage and business interruption damage? Uh, is this going to trigger, uh, Stu, just like you were saying, uh, specific obligations under your service contract? Uh, you, you know, do you have to provide notice of a breach to your client within a certain amount of days? Um, and so it's, it's a whole mishmash, a complex web 
of uh, issues that you have to consider when you're dealing with uh, providing notice on an MSB breach. It's really, it's not unlike a law firm that gets breached and we have multiple clients. And then we have to figure out, okay, do we, you know, what clients do we have to notify? Is this, is this an incident that we have to provide notice for, et cetera? Uh, which states do we have to comply with? What are regulatory schemes? It's not unlike a law firm, but it's, I think it's even more complex than a law firm being breached. All right, everybody, let's move on to the next poll question. What is the biggest cliche in cyber? Again, what is the biggest cliche in cyber? Your choices are, it's not if, but when. We offer full prior acts. It was Russia. I got antivirus, so I'm good. I look forward to reading your responses. David, let's stay with you, and let's now talk about the third-party part of the uh, risk issues that, that uh, MSPs face here. And let's talk about the standard of care. If you get an MSP client, how do you explain to them what is the standard of care that an MSP will be held to? A standard care, I think the first thing is that you want to do is to take a look at the contract to see what types of of obligations that they have, what sort of promises and potential warranties that they made in the contract about the services that they were going to pro provide. But outside that, the standard of care is one of the greatest issues in, in the law. I mean, as we all went to law school, I think a lot of us were expecting to learn black and white rules, and what's so hard about the first year of law school is that you're taught everything is gray and that if something looks black and white, oftentimes that your job is to try to make it look gray. And nowhere is that more prevalent than in the standard of care. I mean, remember my torch professor 25 years ago uh, saying, that was probably uh, 28 years ago by now, uh, saying that it's the reasonably prudent person standard, the RPP. Well, it's the standard of care, then you go look at what's the reasonably prudent managed services provider. Where do you find the basis for determining what a reasonably prudent MSP would do in a given circumstance? Well, you're going to look at their legal requirements, their regulatory requirements. You're going to look at uh, industry standards. Again, you're going to look at what's in the contract in terms of what they promise to do. You're going to look at their advertising to see what they have promised to do, especially as it pertains to security. You're going to look at what the prevailing standards are from other MSPs in the industry. And this is all going to, if this goes to trial, this is all going to be based on expert testimony. So I think this is really an evolving area. It's kind of an exciting area for, for, uh, for uh, me personally. When you go back and you look at, you know, how is a standard of care de developed over time? I mean, look at you know, go back into the introduction of the automobile. I mean, what was the standard of care for automobiles and a driver when automobiles were introduced to our uh, system and to our economy and to our roads? And so, and that has evolved over time. You have issues of negligence per se with automobile liability based upon criminal statutes and, of course, you know, the motor, motor vehicle statutes, but you also have a common law uh, element to it, too. So the standard of care can be a gray mess, and it's evolving, and it's growing, and, it's, and I think that standard of care in terms of what a reasonably prudent managed services provider should do changes every day. I think Nate can uh, tell us about that, that there's new vulnerabilities, there's new threats, and there's new types of tech uh, technology that seems to be introduced every day or every other day, and that changes what the standard of care is. You know, that's really important. Uh, you said it's a big mess. I, I appreciate your, you saying that. Uh, one of the takeaways that we've had when we handle these matters is important. The, the common law, the case law, makes clear that MSPs are not quote-unquote licensed professionals in the sense of a architect is a licensed professional or a doctor is a licensed professional. So there's no professional standard of care. There's no heightened standard of care in that common law uh, malpractice context. 
But what there is is a, in, a, a, a unique standard of care, one that's esoteric and that would, as, as David suggested, would require expert witnesses to, to substantiate. But that standard of care is found in the industry standard, things like NIST and ISO and other you know, published industry standards, as well as, importantly, what's in the contract. And with that, I think, Nathan, can I ask you to comment a little bit from someone that is in a, in a technology services firm, uh, how important is the contract and the scope of work that you put together? Oh, it, it's extremely important. And in, in so many aspects, too, you know, I, I won't dive into all of the liability concern because there's a bunch of attorneys on the phone which would probably you know, tell me I have no idea what I'm talking about, which would be true. Um, but the, the technical side of things, spelling out very clearly what the IT provider, the MSP's responsibilities are, what they will do, what they won't do, is so important. We see it all the time, every day in incidents. Um, not just incidents that we've been talking about where all of the MSP's victims get compromised at, at once, um, that's, that is a huge issue and, and something that can be covered in the contracts and limited. But knowing what the MSP's responsibilities are, for example, we just had an incident where a large, large enterprise was, fell victim to a ransomware attack through a vulnerability in their firewall. So the, the device that protects the perimeter of the entire network. If you get through the firewall, depending on what settings you have, you're, you're on the network and you can conduct malicious acts. There's a couple of vulnerabilities right now that ransomware attack groups are really loving to exploit. And that's the, the vulnerability is it's trivial to compromise. You go to a web page on your computer and it lists the usernames and passwords for that firewall for people who are VPN'd in, which is very common these days because so many people are working from home. It's a way to remotely be on the network working from home. And when that vulnerability is hit, the attacker me immediately gets a list of usernames and passwords that have VPN access, and they can log in. And oftentimes they can use those credentials they just compromised to immediately distribute a ransomware attack. So the reason I mention that, mentioned that specifically is the issue came up in this case, well, whose responsibility was it to patch and update that, vulner that firewall so the vulnerability that originally came out in 2018 shouldn't have been still there in 2020? And you know, that's something that spelling out responsibilities in the statement of work and the services contract is so important. You know, what does maintaining a firewall mean? I think most people would assume that it means patching it, but if that patch is the client's responsibility instead of the MSP, that needs to be spelled out. So knowing very clearly whose responsibility is what is, is important. And that extends to everything. Whose responsibility is it to monitor backups, making sure critical data is backing up properly? Maybe the MSP uh, put them in place originally, but maybe they're not being paid to monitor them permanently. Whose responsibility is it to review antivirus alerts? Almost every incident we investigate has some sort of precursor alert or indicator that just went unnoticed because it's not clearly defined whose responsibility it was. Um, so from the technical side, knowing what services the MSP is legally responsible for and which ones they're not uh, is critical. Nathan, I really appreciate that summary. And Megan, in one of your earlier responses, you began to enumerate some of the theories of liability that plaintiffs or claimants will allege against managed service providers in the IT space. Would you go through that list again, some of the more creative theories that are out there, and then also comment on subrogation, because that's really an area, I think, in, in my practice that we see the role of the managed service provider come up quite a bit. Uh, sure. So Nathan just, he, he articulated so clearly what uh, folks managing a cyber portfolio think about, but oftentimes due to the variant of applications in the market, due to the 
variant of opportunities to either get an insurance meeting, you don't get an insurance meeting, you may get a renewal meeting, you may not. We are really relying upon standard applications that have to move and live with the times. So we ask the firewall questions, we ask the you know, RDP protocol questions. But in reality, we're looking for that aura and sense of ownership within our clients. And so that all bleeds into your question of what the, I'll call them DBI clients, but essentially they're clients of the MSPs, what they allege back to the MSPs in terms of damages. And t typically and most often we see any sort of, um, any sort of variant amounts for notification costs, and that triggers under the policy for unintended breach of contract for a privacy policy. I mean, the reality is that cyber wordings, it's, a, it's an incredibly competitive market. Uh, cyber wordings are still incredibly broad. And that definition of damages in the, in the market, and not specific to any one carrier, in the market is still quite broad. So you have these um, customers, rightfully so, claiming liability back to the MSP in the event of a breach. But the crux of the issue that Nathan just absolutely nailed is who's responsible, right? So you're getting into the tech e and realm of ensuring that you underwrite these contracts, understand who's responsible, that there's mutual ownership within these relationships, and the clients you're insuring, which is either the MSP themselves and or the DBI customer, so the client of the MSP, you want to understand what those, what those contract provisions look like and how you're asking that in your application to suss out, like, hey, is someone, you know, Nathan nailed it, is someone paying attention, right? Because in the event of a breach, it's all going to happen very quickly. There's likely going to be several hundred customers, if not thousands, incited. You know, so we may see single digits sometimes with MSPs, um, but often it's, it's that number is far greater. You know, where do, after you've cleaned up, for example, like the rapid extortion event, okay, now what? You're kind of left with this collateral damage almost, like you have this, massive event. It's almost like a hurricane. You have this massive event, but then you look around and you have all of this collateral damage that just isn't, isn't going to go away, and ultimately who's responsible. And so those are the things that we think about as profit and portfolio owners when we look at organizations like an MSP, but the reality is the MSPs for me are just the tip of the iceberg. Every client that you know, collects data on behalf of someone else has this issue, but MSPs, just in light of what they do and fundamentally who they are and the provisioned access they have to their customers' infrastructure, and if that infrastructure isn't hardened appropriately, nor are the responsibilities on each end called out, that's what makes it the perfect storm very quickly. David, let me go back to you to help me out with uh, going back to law school and going through some of the common defenses that are available to MSPs when there are third-party claims of liability, either by way of breach of contract or negligence or a breach of some implied obligation or, or um, undue re detrimental reliance or something like that. Uh, so, for example, the one that, that we see quite a bit that we argue, e again, because we, we have e either we defend the MSP from the tech e &O claim or in the subrogation context, we are prosecuting a claim against the MSP on behalf of an insurer who's trying to recover from um, from some loss that that was that that was cov that that was uh, that, that that was covered. And in that situation, we argue in the defense contest concurrent causation. Yes, there there may have been a a violation of the standard of care on beh on behalf of the MSP. But there was also an unauthorized access on your part, or there was also some uh, customer interference in the implementation that 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 acted as a uh, a, a break in the causal you know in the causal nexus. So there that con that concept of concurrent causation, particularly in claims involving botched implementations or some other MSP claim, uh, is, is a really legal one. Uh, going back to first year contracts class, the economic loss doctrine. You cannot collect damages from a breach of contract and from a tort, from, from a, um, a negligence claim. You have to pick one, which is another reason why the service contract is so important with MSPs. So for the corporate attorneys that are listening uh, to the phone or if you're general counsel, 
you got to look at the, that, that agreement because uh, that also leads into the contractual defenses that are available, either indemnification clauses or limitations of liability that comes up in every single one of these cases. And I know some of the insurance underwriters actually ask about the limitation of liability provisions in the service agreement. And then, of course, uh, fact-based defenses. Just no, you're, you are, the plaintiff is incorrect in, in, in the assertions. I know we had that once where there was an allegation that there was a, uh, some sort of unauthorized access or a compromise, and, and the defense was, no, this was a hardware failure, and they could prove it, and there's a battle of experts. So it is a, um, these are really interesting issues that arise in the third-party liability context. Yes, I mean, I think... David, let's go to you. Just talk about some of the losses and damages that MSPs are potentially liable for. Well, I think, you know, first you're going to look at the contract, and you have con contract-based damages. But then, of course, as you uh, mentioned earlier, when you look at the contract, then you're going to have a limitation of liability. And then you're going to have, you know, an entire fight over whether or not the, uh, the limitation of liability is enforceable, whether it can be overcome by gross or negligence, et cetera. And then, as you said earlier, then you're going to be dealing with the economic loss doctrine, which in the product liability context prevents you from suing to, for a tort where the damage is just to the product itself. Okay, but still, what I've, seen, what I've seen, especially over the last 12 months or so, is an erosion of those defenses. And you're seeing a broader panoply of damages being sought in third-party claims. And it can, it can be business interruption. It can be lost business. Of course, it can be loss of the value of the contract, value of the services. It can, it, it's starting to be broader. I mean, if, if you go back to the Paul's graph case that we all learned about in Torts of 101, you're seeing, um, I, I think from the courts, a greater scope of damages being allowed in these third-party claims. And you just have to show a strong enough nexus just between the alleged damage and, of course, the uh, breach or the loss of the services. And I think those damages are going to increase exponentially as the MSP industry becomes bigger, and I think we all think it's going to become bigger, and you're going to see more data with MSPs as people uh, start to work remotely on a greater basis, especially after we've been dealing with this pandemic. Um, all right. Brandon Kelly, I'm going to ask you the money question. I think this is the question that the people want to know about. What is aggregated damages, and why is this such a unique risk? We've been sort of flirting with this issue the entire presentation. Can you bring it home for us? Yeah, what's that famous line in the movie, show me the money? <laughs> hey, look, uh, you know, the, the, this is, it is about the money. And, you know, there, there are a couple points I want to build on that were said earlier by really the, the entire panel. And so, first of all, you know, when we look at this and we talk about an incident with an MSP, I think we need to focus on almost a checklist, right? So the money is going to be bigger because of this, the depth and the breadth of the well that we talked about, right? Which by that we mean the customer base and the, the keys to that kingdom in their client base. So let's break it down, the money. The first party bit is very, I don't want to say it's, it's relatively simple in comparison to the third party that was just described. So the first party, it's the same kind of costs and expenses that we're used to seeing, managing through, that sort of thing. Now they're getting the added wrinkle, right, of potentially reputational harm, which is a separate item in most policies, because this, is the, this, is re, this goes to the reputational harm of the MSP itself. So the first party piece is a bit different. I mean, it's is, is very similar to what we've done historically. Now, the third party piece, as we just finished saying, right, that's almost left to the domain of the creativity of the plaintiff's bar. 
So we've said, like, look, it's changing. It was just said in terms of now we're seeing that some of these nature of the, of the third party claims are business interruption. It's the value of the services. Is it contract? Is it toward? Is it the product itself? So much of this, in fact, almost all of it, has not been litigated. What we've seen is the complaints come in the door. How they will play out is yet to be determined. But they're only, as was noted, building in terms of creativity and in terms of breadth of allegations. The final note that I'll say on this that's so interesting, and this is one that Megan's talked about, and we don't want to lose sight of. These aren't just cyber policies we're talking about with an MSP. right? What we're going to see in play as well is a tech E&O policy. So there's the export itself that the cyber policy may or may not respond to. But then the services, right? Do they have a tech E&O policy? that responds to the services that they had been providing that are at issue here. So, you know, um, when we talk about the dollars and bringing this home, Brennan, right, it's talking about first party, third party, and what sort of policies do we have in play, and that's here, and then also are there other policies in play in terms of the, the clients themselves or the customer base. So there you have it. Megan, Brendan was so nice to mention you and the comments you made earlier, so I'm going to turn the next uh, subject to you, but it's related to this issue of damages and losses to the MSB, and it's linked, of course, by insurance coverage. So would, would you kindly explain some of the insurance coverage issues that arise when you have MSP claims come in? Sure. So... MSPs will typically have a first-party component and a third-party component. So this is the MSP themselves. They'll have the first-party component of data breach, BI, any sort of reputational harm, potential investigation, repair, and notification. The customers of the MSP, so the DBIs, they'll have that third-party component that we talked about in terms of those really aggravated damages. Um, and that's where the hornet's nest really comes in because as profit owners accountable to our chief underwriting officers, we have a clear-cut responsibility to understand the legal, reputational threat landscape all at once and ball that together and then understand our insurers, but not only our insurers and their risk profile, but the risk profile of customers. And that's what makes MSPs, just by virtue of their breadth of customers, and then you add the top layer of the security element, it makes it quite a, I'll use the word volatile, volatile segment right now. And what's changed is certainly internally the MSPs by virtue of their contracts, their services, their breadth of services, but externally the environment has changed as well with extortion. Uh, thank you. I, I do note that also the, uh, one issue that comes up, and just to conclude, is in this area of the tripartite relationship, I get that question quite a bit in the MSP context because as breach counsel, we're giving advice to the policyholder. That's the fiduciary obligation. And we also have the dual obligation to the carrier. And I think it's part of our job to explain that dynamic to the client. And the MSP, I think, is particularly sensitive to that issue. And with that, I want to thank the panel uh, as we turn to our final poll question and the Q&A. So final poll question for today's panel is, where should Net Diligence have its super special reunion conference? So I don't know if you guys know this. It's a, it's a, a special conference that's in the works right now. Um, but where should they have that? Should it be in sunny Philadelphia, in Santa Monica, in some one of the new places, Boca Raton, or Lake, Lake Las Vegas? Or should we just keep it virtual? And of course, Texas is a big place. 
Thank you, everyone. Uh, Dave Walton from Cozen O'Connor, Brendan Kelly, CNA, Nathan Little from Tetra Defense, Megan Han from Hiscox, I'm Stu Pinansky from Fisher Broyles. Thank you to Net Diligence, and thank you to you. Thank you, everyone. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we are going to now turn to the question and answer period, which we have been doing our best to try to get to answers to all the questions. Um, we are really excited to say that we had a tremendous amount of questions. We, we tried to answer the ones that we could. Uh, if we did not get to answer your question, uh, please be patient. We might be able to try to hit it after the presentation uh, or just try to find one of us after the presentation. So we're probably not going to get to them all. Uh, in fact, what we're going to do is focus on one question that we all sort of were interested in answering. And the question was uh, really started with an observation that MSPs have been an attractive target since the, the last few years. Is there any indication that things are getting better? Uh, are there statistics in that regard? Are there, um, uh, what is the prognostication for the future? And in that regard, Nathan, can we start with you from a technical perspective? What are you seeing? Are, are MSP security getting better? Yeah, absolutely, Stu. I think in some aspects, MSP security is getting better because when, especially this past Christmas, when we all saw a, a ton of MSP incidents, there there had been already and continued to be a really big push educating MSPs on, on the risk of some of their tools. A lot of these breaches happen through external remote access tools, different than like the traditional remote desktop access that we see so many breaches happen from. But things, remote management tools like Kaseya and Ninja, RMM, and things like that. And there's been a huge push to secure those more by the actual software vendors. I mean, that's a, a simple answer. I think in some aspects they are getting better, but attack methods are also changing. So Megan, what about from the insurance underwriting perspective, are, do you, from your, do you, what, internally, what are you guys seeing? Are MSP security getting better? I think the right word to use here is maybe not better. Um, and I'm looking at it not only from the MSP's perspective, but also the DBI's perspective, so the client of the MSP's. Awareness comes to mind. So there's certainly an increased awareness that this is not necessarily just a one-sided issue. Naturally, the MSP's are in the business of security and hosting. so. I think the general assumption has been, well, they have world-class security because this is their business. Um, and clients are starting to really realize that they need to look at, look at take, a, take a very close look at their contracts to see what kind of provisioning is offered for each individual environment or data set, inclusive of you know, two-factor authentication, failed login attempts. The basics still apply, and it's, just a, it's, a, it's certainly a one-to-many relationship, but the basics still apply in terms of what we've been underwriting in the industry for 10 plus years, just a bit of a contract application instead of a insured being responsible for their own security, they now have to more or less underwrite their MSP. And then the MSP can't rest on their laurels, they really need to up their game in terms of uh, security posture. Brendan Kelly, CNA, what say you? Yeah, so, uh, hi everyone. Um, look, it's, you know, it's, uh, Back to the question, too, in part that, you know, as you phrased it, Stu, you know, how do we prognosticate out on this? You know, and in terms of any real stats, I don't have them on hand, but it, to the root of it, is it going to go away? I mean, time will tell. I mean, I think as Nathan pointed out, the attack methods are changing. And, you know, as Megan highlighted, look, there there continues to be a lot of education she says awareness absolutely and so there's a responsiveness to the community from an underwriting standpoint but also from those impacted the msps and its customers so it's it's everyone sort of responding and reacting but i don't see it go in terms of prognosticating it's not going away tomorrow will we see it through in 2020 yes um there's it's too attractive of a piece for these threat actors to walk away from now. And it's still, it's still available to them through these revised attack methods. And Dave Walton, in next year, will you have more MSP clients or less MSP clients? 
Well, I'm an optimist, so I'll say more MSP clients, but I think that uh, we will definitely, the just like uh, Brendan's saying, that they are, uh, MSPs are such an attractive target that I don't think the uh, issues of liability and the issues of cybersecurity regarding them are going to go away. I think we're going to see more lawsuits, and I think we're going to see more recovery opportunities, too. Well, thank you very much for everyone for participating. Thank you, and diligence for the opportunity. There is a winner for the magnificent shiny platypus illustration contest, and Net diligence will be announcing the winner in the future, as well as the results of the very special polling question that we had at the end about the reunion tour for Net diligence. So stay tuned for that. And otherwise, we'll see everybody next time. Enjoy the rest of the conference.